And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Carmel Bell, medical intuitive who's had four near-death experiences, which we're going to learn about and more. Carmel, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thanks for asking me to join you, Jeff, and I'm very happy to be here and meet you finally. Well, we are very happy to have you, Carmel. And if you don't mind, we'll just talk about your NDEs in order. So let's yep. start with your first one. My first NDE was when I was four years of age and um, we lived in the country. So it was cold and um, I woke up at about four o'clock in the morning and it was winter. And because it was so cold, I got myself up and was doing a little bit of cleaning for my mum. And I turned on a heater, like a, a radiator that just had coat hanger wire. And I didn't realise that my nighty swung into the heater. By the time I realised uh, it had burnt up to my knees and the flames were reaching quite high up. So in, I ran out of panic and um, fell onto the floor in my um, hallway, in the hallway. And I basically passed out. And um, my father woke up, saw a uh, light flickering and realised that something was wrong. And he raced and found me and put the flames out. But from the shock and the smoke inhalation, I uh, died briefly. And um, that was a very brief experience, but it changed my entire life because nobody knew about near-death experiences there wasn't really any research into it, so um, they didn't know how to look after me or how to treat me. But whilst I was dead, I met for the first time the Archangel Metatron and uh, Jesus. And I didn't meet Jesus because I was a uh, Christian. By that stage, I'd already told a priest that I didn't want to call God Father because I had had a perfectly good father of my own. And <laughs> I was a very rambunctious child. And um, they introduced themselves to me as Metatron and Jesus. And then they introduced me to another person uh, who titled himself Peter. And he told me that he was my main guide. And then he introduced me to another being, Hiram and who was the healer. And they told me that uh, I wasn't meant to be dead yet, that um, I was not going to be the doctor that I dreamed of being, but I would be a doctor who was not a doctor. And Metatron gave me an energy frequency to use and to bring to the world. And then they sent me back into my body and from that point on my life really radically changed oh that's right they also told me that I would meet and marry a man named Bernie and um I'd never heard that name at that age and it set me you know I came back into my body and from that point on I went from as my mother put it, from a happy and joyful child who loved dressing up and wearing pink to a child that didn't want to wear anything but black and became uh, socially isolated. I didn't want to play with my friends and I just wanted to like um, practice healing my toy dolls and healing our animals and that sort of thing. And she was very, very concerned about me, she thought that I was um, going a bit crazy, I think. Do you recall what all those beings look like? Yes, can I you, do. Can you share that with us? Okay. Well, if you if Metatron were in here now, he would be about um, 10 feet tall. He was very, very large. And... Uh, he had, uh, I suppose, like an um, an 
Mediterranean skin color would be the closest I could say mm -hmm. to it. And his hair was very silver. And he, the, the most extraordinary thing about him were his eyes. When he bent down and was looking at me and I looked into his eyes, it was like looking into a galaxy. If you could compress like the Milky Way, for instance, and put it into it, a person's eyes that's what his eyes were like and that's that is like the thing that stands out to me always when I think of of Metatron and I talk to him of his eyes it felt like you could drown in them and Jesus was looked nothing like what you see in you know you go into a church and you see that very blonde blue-eyed whatever being he didn't look anything like that at all he had quite swarthy skin and his hair was uh, a brown color like a sunburnt brown color and he was wearing just like rough hewn robes and sandals on his feet and he was a normal height a normal size and um, I remember his hands they were strong and capable hands you know you you looked at them hands always fascinate me and you know so I looked I tend to look at beings hands and he had you know strong and, and capable hands he was fairly broad-shouldered but he wasn't muscular or big he was you know a, a normal build sinewy all right, let's move forward to your second NDE. My second NDE came about um, when I was 15. I, I'm one of six children in my family. And when I was 15 at Christmas time, um, my parents used to hand out all the presents and they literally forgot me. Mm -hmm. Like they hand out all the gifts and they got to the end of all the gifts and um, there was nothing there for me. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, I really don't belong in this family. A lot of things had happened before that. My grandparents had tried to adopt me because they thought I was being mistreated by my parents and um, my dad wouldn't let them. Otherwise, I would have grown up as my mother's sister. And um, anyway, I got up and I left the room, went to my bedroom and packed a bag and then my parents came out and they realized and they apologized and gave me money and said they'd take me shopping when the you know for a gift when the shops opened and I thanked them and I tucked the money into my jeans grabbed my bag and I uh, walked out the door and um I went to my boyfriend's house and we all rode motorbikes so, you know, for a little bit of fun, we thought we'd start up a young, like a motorcycle gang just for laughs. It wasn't anything particularly serious. Anyway, uh, one evening we were all at a fish and chip shop and this guy rode up on a motorbike, you know, who we'd seen around quite a few times, and he asked if he could join our little club. I was the only girl. There was about 17 men. And, um, you know, we agreed if he could beat the president. <laughs> and at that stage, I was the president of this gang because it was kind of like a joke club. And um, <clears throat> I ended up knocking this guy out. Like I said to him, if you can get one punch in on me, uh, you can join. And he says, oh, ladies, first have the first shot. So I king hit him and knocked him out, broke his nose. Anyway, when he woke up again a couple of minutes later with a bleeding nose, I was very contrite and I said to him, because I only knew him as Zeb, and I said to him, what is your name, like for real? And he said, oh, my name's Bernie. And I just about fell over backwards. So uh, long story short, again, he and I ended up, like I ended up, splitting up with my boyfriend and Bernie and I ended up going out together. And as a joke, we told, um, I hadn't seen my family for a few years and I took him over to meet my family 
And I walked in and I said, G'day, Mum. G'day, Dad. This is Zeb. We're getting married. And they took it seriously. I was 17 at that time. Anyway, we ended up getting married. And um, I thought, well, there's the prediction. You know, I'm done. Um, anyway, and not long after we married, I fell pregnant. And then I actually lost the baby. And the obstetrician who was looking after me said that he wanted to do a DNC, a dilation and curette, to make sure that everything was fine. So he put me into a hospital. And in the hospital, under the um, anaesthetic, I had a cardiac arrest. And whilst I was temporarily dead, I met uh, these beings again, like Metatron was there and Peter was there. And Peter said to me, Carmel, you've married the wrong Bernie. This is not your husband. And I was so distressed because I really loved my husband. In fact, it's nearly 45 years since then and we are still very close. Anyway, um, I said to them, can't I stay married to him? I really love him. And they showed me a life where I would have a normal kind of housewifey, boring life or I could leave and wait for the right Bernie to come along. And um, about two years after that, I, you know, he did a few things that were really quite unforgivable and I did end up leaving him, taking our son. We had a son by that stage and I, I took myself and our son and I left him. It took 14 years to divorce him because we both really loved each other. <clears throat> and then my third NDE, I was about 29 and I'd met another man. I'd given up on meeting Bernie number two and um, anyway this man and I decided to get married and then I accidentally fell pregnant and this guy was uh, six foot seven and felt like a you know brick proverbial and when I told him I was pregnant he just went nuts grabbed me around the throat, lifted me up, slammed me against the wall and started punching holes in the wall next to my head. And he said, have an abortion or I will kill you. So I left him. I packed up my house uh, when he was away. He used to parachute. I was a pilot. He was a parachutist. And um, he went away for the weekend parachuting. I packed up my house, grabbed my young son, Harley, and I left. And I had the baby on my own, who's now 33, I think. And um, when my second son was being born, I started to bleed out. I started to hemorrhage. And my son was born dead and they revived him but they couldn't stop the bleeding so they rushed me into surgery and um to try and stop the bleeding and during that time I'd actually lost sufficient blood that I I died and I had my third NDE where again my guides told me that I could stay doing what I'm doing and I would live an ordinary life or I could do what they asked me to do, which was to bring metatronic energy to the world and to work as a medical intuitive. So I agreed to do that. Anyway, about oh, probably about three years earlier, I had decided to do a massage course to learn anatomy. I had the massage course, and this was the interesting thing. I I'm, I was very shy then, and uh, I went into the classroom to learn an anatomy and massage. I sat up the front, 
And all these people started streaming in behind me. This was like a 12-month course, so it was pretty full on. And um, my guide said to me, Carmel, turn around, he's here. And I turned and looked over my shoulder and I saw this man walking into the classroom who I'd never seen before and he he just stood out to me like he had a light on him and he looked up straight into my eyes. He had the bluest eyes I have ever seen. And my guide said to me, he's here, that's your Bernie. And he had the same thing, like he'd felt called to do this course, didn't really want to do it, but, you know, thought he'd do it anyway and looked at me and felt this instant connection. So he came up and sat next to me and he said, oh, hi, I'm Bernie. What's your name? And I just about fell off my seat. But anyway, at that stage I was engaged. He was actually married. And so nothing came of it. We formed a very good friendship but eventually lost touch with each other. He was at my engagement party when I got engaged to um, my fiancé at the time. And um, little did he know that I had fallen pregnant and my relationship had broken up and I'd gone off to have my son on my own, which is when I had the um, uh, third NDE. And um, so I was actually living at my parents with my then two sons and um, I had found a clairvoyant who could train me in how to actually control my clairvoyant gifts, how I could listen, you know, when I wanted to, to my guides and how I could block myself, keep myself safe, um, how I could trust what I was picking up, that sort of thing. And um, I was at one of those classes uh, one day when my father at home got a phone call from the second Bernie, his marriage had split up and he'd actually tracked me down by just like remembering details that I'd told him about my life, including my parents' surname and what their jobs were and stuff. And he rang up and spoke to my father and he said, oh, look, I'm looking for Carmel. Does she live there? And Dad said to him, oh, look, she's out at the moment. Give me your number and I'll get her to call you back. So he took Bernie's number. And I came in from class and I walked in the front door and my dad said, oh, somebody rang for you while you're out. And I said, oh, really, who? And he said, oh, I don't know, some fellow said he knew you. His name was Bernie. And I just about fell off my seat or feet because I was standing. I could not believe it that he had actually found me. So I rang him back straight away just full of this elation and um, we organised to have dinner the next night together. And he did. And basically he he never left. He came over to visit me and basically never left. We've been together ever since that time. So he he was my Bernie. Those, you know, those are the, the first three things. So they really, like, were uh, course redirections is how I look at them. And so at that stage I didn't know anybody who'd had an NDE at all. And if I, you know, like I often put myself into some form of counselling to try and sort out like why I felt the way I felt and why I was confused and so forth. And the therapists that I saw couldn't give me any answers. You know, they they really didn't know anything about it and and it, people disbelieved that I would have this, you know, they, they counted it as some sort of uh, delusion from having had these traumas like my, you know, having a cardiac arrest and bleeding out and whatever, they put it down to a delusional thing and, um, you know, would, would suggest to me that I needed pretty solid psychiatric help because I was hearing voices so obviously I must be, you know, whatever, you know, schizoid or schizophrenic or whatever. 
And I knew that that absolutely was not the case. I knew that what I was hearing was genuine because, you know, the information was was relevant and was accurate and I tested it all the time. Like uh, one way I would test it is I would get a deck of cards and I would turn it over and I would hold it, hold them in my hands, pick up a card without looking at it, and then I would try to to tell what colour it was and then what number it was, so like it was nine of diamonds or the eight of spades or whatever. And I would practice that on a daily basis and I would get on average about 47 out of 52 cards correct. Wow. That's and great. that's how I, you know, yeah, was very good. I would have made a good gambler, I guess. <laughs> You felt like these NDEs were a course correction. Do you, yeah. do you yeah. think these NDEs were planned some way pre-birth? Yes, I do. I do think that they were planned pre-birth. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. I have Thanks. a very interesting family history. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of people don't realize my history, but they know of my family. Like, my mother's family, which is usually these sort of gifts passed down through the mother, uh, and my mother's family uh, is the Sinclairs. Now, do you know of the Roslyn Chapel in Scotland? Yeah, I've never been there, but I know well, of it. Okay. Well, that belongs to my family. My um, my family owns the Roslyn Chapel and Roslyn wow. Castle. Not me personally, I'm just part, I'm part of the trust, you know, and we all like pay to keep it under good repair and so forth. Anyway, that belongs to my family. And um, the legend is in my family that one of our family in every generation will have this gift, the gift of healing, right? Sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a woman, and this time it is me. So, you know. When I think of the Roslyn Chapel, I obviously think of the Da Vinci Code book. Yeah. And so what comes to mind is, are you in some way related to Jesus? Yes. In what way? Well, Jesus actually told me that he was my um, my father, like uh, I think how he put it, he said, you know, to me, I am, I am your father and your grandfather and your grandfather's grandfather. Like, I come from his line. And, you know, that's, that is what I was taught all my life is that, you know, we come from that lineage. Would you say then that the story is true, that Jesus did get married and have children? Yes. Yes. Do you know yes. much about what happened to the family after that? No, I don't. My older sister uh, is the family genealogist, and she is you know, internationally recognized as a genealogist. She, if anybody had that history, she would. I have... Um, maybe to my shame, I have paid extremely little interest in any of that. I am what I am. And this was what I was taught when I was growing up, not in any way to be arrogant, but it was, it was, a, um, it was more a sense of that we in this family have strong gifts, strong abilities, and it's up to us to find out ways to use them. Would you say then that all of those abilities originally come from Jesus? Yeah, I would. All right. Not, not in the Christian sense. I can tell you I am not religious. I carry no religion. No. Uh, it's more in a sense of, of the sacredness of everything, that everything Every moment matters. Everything is sacred. 
and you know have you seen the da vinci code movie or read the book and if so what do you think about it uh i think that dan brown needed to do a lot more research i think that you know he titled another family i forget their name with the m italian or whatever and um genealogically however you might say that word they actually bear no connection to the roslyn chapel so you know i actually found the da vinci code like i understood lots of people loved it but i actually found the da vinci code to be uh, a very frustrating movie and i absolutely admire tom hanks i think he's a fantastic individual but I also think it's possibly one of his worst ever movies. Terrible acting. Terrible. So, you know. I think, there you go. I think I'm not a movie critic, though. Well, that's okay. The thing that I found most interesting about the book and the movie, at least the book, mm -hmm. is it says that all the. Well, I don't remember the exact quote, but it said something like, you know, all the descriptions of art and history are true. He's trying to say that all the claims in the book are true. Yeah. Well, you know, being a part of the family, I, I have the privilege of being able to go into places where other people aren't allowed to go. And if he was talking, I can't, you know, I know I've read the book or at least parts of it, but my last death took a lot of trivia from my head. Um, the artwork, the carvings in the chapel and the vaults where the general public aren't allowed to go uh, are amazing, absolutely amazing. All right, here's the big question. Is the Holy Grail in that church? Or what do they call San Grial? Yeah, I, I do not know. I do not know. You know, I've I've never looked for it. I do know that my my maternal family uh, has acted in interesting ways, and you know there there is, for instance, uh, under the the crypt, there is a whole horse and a knight in full armor buried. You know, and I know that that is there. Um, there are more bodies there than have been looked at or exhumed and I know that my family were part of a, a society that um, did a lot of research and traveling you know and they took part in the crusades and you know so forth that sort of thing um, it could very easily be buried under there I've been to the Roslyn Chapel several times in my life. I've travelled to Scotland to to meet my cousins and and to um, go to Roslyn in particular. And I have stood in you know places where you know like uh, you you stand in a certain spot at a certain time of day, and this ray of light just comes down and like lights you up it's amazing and the the stone carving in that place is so extraordinary it is simply a beautiful structure it is just stunning particularly the apprentice pillar it is just beautiful well i hope if i ever visit there that you're going to be there so you can get me backstage to all the cool stuff <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you'd have to tell me. We'd have to line it up. <laughs> right, right. All right, well, I've completely sidetracked you onto the Da Vinci Code and the Roslyn Chapel. What happened during your fourth NDE? In my fourth NDE, which was by far and away the most extensive, that also has a little bit of history to it in that I was forewarned. When I was 14, uh, there was a summer day and I was hanging out on the, the sidewalk nature with a couple of girlfriends and one of my guides said to me, 
that I would die when I was 47. And um, I said to my girlfriends, oh, I'm going to die when I'm 47. And they laughed at me and I kind of laughed at myself too. But inside me came this sense of like, you know, you feel like there's a time clock in you sometimes, like tick, 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 tick. You can feel like time is running out. And that is how I started to feel. So I was in a bit of a rush to do everything. And I did, you know, I achieved a, a lot of things. And part of that was leaving home. And um, I always kept it at the back of my head and tried not to worry about it too much. But I remember when I was coming up for 47, this sense of doom, as it were, fell over me. And I, so strong was it that I started to do things like uh, I gave away a lot of possessions. Um, I wrote letters to people that I had felt I'd hurt and apologised to them, repaired a lot of relationships and, you know, had a new will made and um, had powers of attorney put in place so that um, my husband could access our funds if something happened to me, if I was dead or in a coma. And I turned 47 and um, woke up the next morning going, well, I'm not dead. I said, I'd die at 47 and I'm not dead. Oh, well, I'll just keep on working. And by that stage, I was running a college of medical intuition. I'd had medical intuition legally recognised and um, I'd become a member of the Integrative Medical Association. So I was the only non-doctor who was a member. And, um, you know, I'd like really achieved some great success for medical intuition. But I was 47 and I hadn't died. Then the new year ticks over and it's February and one of my nieces was getting married and we were invited to the wedding. And I remember the day of the wedding, um, I decided to, you know, about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, I thought I'd better have a shower and wash my hair and put on makeup and get ready and all that sort of stuff. So I did that. And then I was looking in the mirror, putting on my makeup, and I was hit with this overwhelming grief that, of the like that I have never felt before and haven't since. I just literally dropped to the floor and started to cry. I started just to sob and sob. I could barely breathe. And I remember like praying to God and saying, God, I don't know if I'm ready, but, you know, if I need to die, I will die. But look after my cat. I had this cat that I just adored. Please, you know, look after him and look after my children because my daughter was only eight, you know. So, like, my kids were still quite young. And um, I don't know how long I cried for. I really have no idea. But eventually I got up and cooled down my face and put on my makeup and got ready and my husband came home from work. He rides motorbikes for a living. And um, anyway, he came home from work, picked me up and we went to this wedding and reception. And um, eventually we came home, we got home just before midnight and I cleaned my face and hopped into bed and you know, snuggled up to my husband and fell asleep. And the next thing that I knew, I was standing next to my bed. I, I remember thinking to myself, it's odd, how did I get here? What am, what am I doing, like standing here? And then I looked down to get back into bed and I saw a body lying where I normally sleep. And I was actually taken aback. I was like, what? 
And um, then I realised it was me, but it was it was hard for me to recognise my body because it looked so like a mannequin. It just just looked lifeless, like there was nothing there. And um, I thought, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to panic. So I laid back on my body and found myself standing up again. It was like, boing. Now I tried again, boing, standing up again. And I thought, this is not going to work. Obviously, there's something going on. And I'm looking around the room expecting, you know, some kind of apparition of lights or energy to take me into heaven. And I thought, I'm not ready to go. So I started yelling at my husband, wake up, I'm dead. I mean, literally, like, so all I could think of to do was hope that my spiritual voice would get through to him. And then I moved around to his side of the bed and shook him a few times, but it obviously did nothing. Like, I'm trying to shake him and nothing's happening. And that went on for a little while. And I really, you know, I like, I was just absolutely at a loss. What can I do? And in the end, I just gave up. I thought, that's it, I'm dead. I'll just wait till the lights or whatever it is appear because I'd never actually consciously been awake, you know, or woken up whilst I was dead. And um, then the lights did appear, this sort of like light kind of thing and I'm moving away from it going no 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 I'm not ready to go I'm not ready to go and so I'm trying to move away and keep away from it and then my husband did wake up he actually did wake up and I said oh thank god I'm safe anyway he woke up and he got out of bed and I thought that's it and he walked around the bed and he went into our ensuite to go to the toilet just to urinate and um I thought to myself that's it I'm stuffed because, you know, we all know, like, men of a certain age, they get a little bit slow. And my husband, in the middle of the night, just sits down on the toilet and often falls asleep on the toilet, you know, before he rouses himself up again. You know, a few minutes later, who knows how long, he got up and he walked back into the bedroom and he got into bed and he rolled over to just give me a kiss. So he did, he gave me a kiss. And he said to me that he realised that I was dead because I was very cold. And he said, like I remember him hearing him say, oh, Carmel, what have you done? Because, you know, I told him that I was going to die and he, he kind of ignored me. And he turned on the light and I'm lying there in the bed on my back and my skin's blue, my eyes are partially open and glassy. So... He began CPR. At that stage, he was an ambulance paramedic. So he began CPR and he tried that for a few minutes. And um, then he got out of or got off the bed and ran down the hallway to one of our children's rooms and uh, woke him up and he told our son, James, he said, wake up, your mother's dead. I need you to call the ambulance. So I was blue. When I was found and, you know, Bernie did the initial lot of CPR. Anyway, once, you know, I sort of watched him and started relinquishing to these lights and then some short, very brief space of time later, I heard the ambulance arrive. It was actually a fire truck because they were the closest. Our fireys do the first, you know, first responder stuff. And um, I heard them come and I thought, okay, I'm safe now. So I let myself go into this other space. I sort of basically stepped into the lights and then I was in this other place. And once again, um, well, initially I was on my own. I could see beings, you know, some distance away from me. I don't know how to you know, like trying to describe distance when you're talking about heaven. Um, I suppose it's personal perception, but initially I was very much on my own and it was kind of dark about the same time there as it was on earth where I am. 
And I just started to walk. You know, I didn't know what else to do. I thought, you know, what can I do? Because I don't know that I want to be dead, but I'm really tired. So I just started to walk where I could see these people, well, you know, a couple of people. In my previous experiences, I, when I had found myself in heaven without all this preamble, and uh, I had always found myself at a, like an oasis kind of place so I could see palm trees and a water pool and, you know, some rocks and things. And um, I saw that place again, so I walked to that space. And I actually find, you know, even to this day, I actually find it very emotional to to talk about about this, you know. So um, anyway, so I found these people, and again, it was Metatron and Jesus, and they welcomed me, and. I started, I, I remember I just literally fell to my knees and I started to cry. And I just said to them, you know, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. Because, you know, by that stage, and, and you know, this is 15 years ago now, but, you know, the world that I was living in, medical intuition was not openly accepted which is why I'd done so much work. And, you know, you, you couldn't really go out and say to people, this is what I do, without them becoming very adversarial, some of them, or them wanting to test you out, you know, that, that kind of thing, and um, challenge, challenging you. So it wasn't, like you, you, it wasn't like you could say to people, oh, I'm, a, I'm a solicitor or I'm an engineer, and then go, cool, you know. So, you know, and even my children in school had been bullied because I was a medical intuitive, you know, intuitive. I'd had to move them out of the school that they were in into new schools to stop them from being bullied. And um, so I just, like, spent some time initially crying with, uh, Metatron and Jesus because my whole life had felt like this one exhausting battle and because of the the way you know that I was using my my gifts because you know I was seeing about 25 clients a week and teaching every fourth weekend so I'd be moving you know, around Australia, I'd be going to a different city in Australia and teaching. And um, occasionally I'd be going overseas to to teach or to treat people. So it was a really busy, you know, busy life. And I had actually developed a brain tumour out of all the use of my uh, energetic purposes, uh, per use, um, <clears throat> a fairly harmless tumour, so, you know, it wasn't too bad, but like an overuse of a, a particular gland had created more a lesion that they call it a tumour. Anyway, so there I am in heaven saying to Jesus and Metatron, <clears throat> you know, that I was really tired and they said to me that if I wanted to, I could give up this work and I could let myself be dead, I could remain dead, that I had done enough. And I thought about my husband raising our children on his own and I thought I really don't want him to go through that. So. You know, they, they, it was more like a, a pep, I don't know, pep talk, I guess I would say. You know, they told me that I had done a good job, that I had got the energy out there, that it would continue to grow. But if I chose to go back, 
I could also choose to be back on Earth and be an, a normal human, or I could continue in my field. I really didn't know what I wanted to do at at that stage. I pretty much was at a loss. But in the end, I, as I said, I decided to come back and step into my body because I didn't want my husband to have to raise our kids on his own. He had very little support from, you know, either of our families, and they were difficult children. What caused you to die? Well, they've done lots of testing on me, and I had uh, what is called a VF arrest. So I had an actual cardiac arrest not a heart attack like there was no pain there was no actual warning of this my heart just stopped most people when they have a cardiac arrest have an af arrest which is atrial and it's up the top i had a vf arrest which is ventricle arrest down the down the bottom so it was electrical it was like basically my wiring got screwed up for some reason. So my heart just stopped. It got stuck. Couldn't go anymore. Nothing wrong with my heart. It's, you know, my heart is fabulous, you know, still. And you know, I get tested every six months to make sure that my heart is still, you know, doing well and it's, and it's in a really good, healthy place. So I think that I was, well, I, you know, my belief and knowledge is that I was just so exhausted, absolutely so exhausted. You know, I had, oh God, I had clients booked out all the time for like three months ahead. And what I would do when it, got too much is I would close my books and then I would work through the clients that I had and when I got to the end of that period I would take a week or two weeks off usually during school holidays and then my secretary would book like the next three months of people so you know like it was it was intense pressure absolutely in intense pressure and a lot of, you know, just um, weary of having to justify myself. And, um, you know, now, nowadays in many countries of the world, there is a lot of research being done in uh, the power of intuition and medical diagnosis. And, um, you know, as I've been tested by one of our medical universities over here and have been, you know, validated and proven to be genuine. I, you know, I can genuinely see energy and genuinely pick up illnesses and diagnose them. But, you know, I don't know if anybody can imagine what it's like to be just one person and meet opposition almost everywhere you go, you know meet and have your children be bullied and, you know, that kind of thing because you're doing something that you, you know, I couldn't help but do it. You know, it it is me. It is what I do naturally. So how could I help but do it? But, you know, people, like people were so desperate I would get, I remember one stage, you know, a lady came around at three o'clock in the morning and, you know, I keep my address quite hidden now because, you know, this this woman came around at three o'clock in the morning and is banging on my front door because she was desperate to see me. Like, seriously, you know, seriously, it's not what you do. Make an appointment, you know, just like I know I actually had, um, oh, last week, a group of ladies who have a little discussion group asked if 
uh, I would come in and give them a talk for an hour. And my husband does all the booking. So he took over from there and he said, oh, yes, you know, um, Carmel charges this much per hour. And these ladies, well, you know, the one who was riding with him, got really angry and said to him, how dare she charge for a gift that was given to her by God? She should give it freely. Oh, yeah, maybe. But every gift we have is a gift given, given by God. I mean, every gift. You know, the person who makes fabulous dresses. Do you think that came, you know, by accident? That's a gift from God. Like what you do is a gift from God. You have this ability because God gifted you with, you know, part of this ability and you've chosen to enhance it. And I'm sure you've put in hours and hours and hours of work refining what you do and all this sort of stuff and, you know, and I've got, oh, you know, I have four biological children, three foster children that, you know, I, I look after, you know, they're mostly grown up now, but I still help them. And, you know, I, how can I give my services for free? I just give it away. So, you know. Besides the gifts that you already had, did you get any new abilities as a result of your NDEs? No, not really. Not at all. Um, I already had all the abilities, you know, and I believe that they came and were enhanced by you know, the, the previous NDEs. And in fact, for the first couple of years after this last NDE, um, I had my guides shut off my, my gifts so that my brain could actually take a rest. But, you know, if you realise um, 47 minutes at least dead and then in a coma, and, you know, the doctors, the medical staff told my husband that I would never be able to walk again and I would never be able to coherently communicate again and I needed to be in a nursing home. Do you know how long you were dead for? I was dead for um, 47 plus minutes. The estimate, like, they can say, we know you were dead for 47 minutes, definitely, because they did CPR and electroshocks and adrenaline for 47 minutes. Um, I was dead, the guesstimate is, for over an hour. Uh, they cracked my sternum, broke all my ribs, giving me, most people don't survive CPR. They, even when they got me into hospital, they didn't think that I would survive. And um, they thought that I would have another cardiac arrest very shortly in, you know, in hospital, probably under a coma, in the coma and die. So all of my medical team are quite astounded that I survived. And, um, you know, I'm, I am regarded by them as, as one doctor said, the only word we can give it is a miracle. It's a miracle, you know. But, it, you know, it didn't come back straight away. There was no extra enhancement from this last NDE because my, my guides shut off all my abilities. And that was probably one of the worst periods of my life is when my husband brought me home. You know, they, they put me into rehab. So I was in a rehab hospital for, I think, about six weeks after I came out of the coma. And um, when I, I, for the first time in my life, I couldn't hear my guides and I couldn't see anything. Like I couldn't see energy and I couldn't feel anything. And my head hurt and I couldn't I couldn't walk I couldn't stand upright because it had destroyed my balance center and um couldn't run couldn't do you know I needed assistance getting dressed washing going to the toilet 
eating, all that stuff. I was very disabled. And um, then one day I was lying in my bed and I was by myself and I was literally lying there just crying because I felt so lost and so bereft by these, you know, I was, I'd been so used to feeling always like I was safe, encased, you know, with somebody with me. Anyway, and I was lying in bed and I felt this hand on the top of my head, you know, just like that. And I was a bit surprised. I opened my eyes and looked up and it was my guide, Hiram, who is my healing guide. And he was leaning over me and he had his hand on the top of my head and that largely fixed pretty much everything that was wrong with me. From that point on, I started to get my memory back and I started to be able to actually, you know, walk standing upright and um, then I found uh, who you probably heard a minute ago, whinging my German shepherd, Andy. Um, I was asked if I could rehabilitate this guy. He he was a very abused dog. And um, so I took him in, even though I could barely walk. And with his assistance, I learned to run again. So I was walking and running, you know, like after this massive period of time where I was without oxygen and a heartbeat, here I was running and like lifting weights again and exercising and doing everything that I needed to do. It was, it was amazing. But, you know, I think that my last near-death experience was because I was so burnt out, I was so tired that out of kindness they gave me a choice. Was I ready to come, you know, to come back home and rest or did I still want to continue on? And, um, you know, because I really did not know, I really had no idea if I did want to or if I didn't want to. but. In the end, you know, I decided that I did want to, you know, I do want to. Like, I, I really want to to help heal people, but not, not just like a one-on-one, -on -one, but teach people how to access this energy and how to heal themselves. So... You know, that's, that is what I firmly believe was the purpose of the fourth NDE. And um, you know what, Jeff, I would never wish such an experience on anybody because it is so hard to recover from. You know, and you lose as much in many ways as you gain. Do you fear death? Do I fear death? No. No, I don't. I know that I will be okay. Um, I, at times I do feel really apprehensive about death because I still have so many things that I would like to achieve, you know, that feels crucial. And I think to myself sometimes, gosh, you should, you should get an ambition that isn't related to medical intuition. Um, I can't think of anything that I really would want to do, you know, which is maybe a bit crazy, but I honestly can't. I have no idea. If you had a friend that was grieving over the loss of a loved one, what type of advice would you give? Well, I have had that more than once. I have had that happen to me. And what I give them is to have faith that there is life after this life that we do go on, but do not expect your loved one to communicate with you in the short interim 
because they're not capable. They're still readjusting and, and finding their own feet. So, you know, the, the thing is, is that people either believe that there is something after death or they don't. And there's very little that you can say to convince them that there is life after, you know, life after death. Um, although, again, science is starting to prove or has actually proven that the energy we don't our energy doesn't actually go away. You know, our energy continues on. So, we, you know, we know that we don't, our body dies, but our energy doesn't. But when my father, my father died a couple of years ago, <clears throat> and um, which was a very distressing event for me, he was a massive loss for me. And um, when he died, my mother rang me up pretty much the second he died. And she said, Carmel, your father has just died. Can you come? And I hopped into my car and I sped like a banshee straight to their retirement home to be there. And when I got there, his body was cold, you know, and had like the locked jaw and all that sort of stuff, but his energy was still in the room. So, you know, he hadn't passed over yet. And so I just walked up to him, his energy, and let him step into me. And I stepped back so that he and my mother could talk. And he just grabbed her and sobbed on her shoulder and apologised to her. He said, I'm sorry, my love, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't mean to die, I'm sorry. And, you know, they talked about, very briefly, I only held him there for a few minutes because it is actually hard work. But when he had, like, apologised to her and expressed his feelings to her, he was able to leave and his energy left the room. And um, which is not an uncommon thing, you know, that people who have left their body need help to move into the next level, which is, I guess, why we now have death doulas. Have you seen those? I believe I've had one or two as a guest. Oh, really? Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting profession. I don't think I'm cut out for it personally. You know, I actually find dead bodies to be quite confronting. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Yes, I'm open to that. They would have to go through my, you know, Facebook page. I think that's about the only place that I am uh, contactable or uh, they can send an email if you're able to put that up to me personally, which is um, carmel, all lowercase, carmel.bell at yahoo.com. Do you have anything that you're working on that you want people to know about? Yes, I'm actually working on um, opening up my college again to train people how to 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 do what I do, which you know, it's quite an intense course. You know, there are other places that you can learn medical intuition, but mine is takes, I suppose, the longest and is the most intense because it's based on you know all my years of work. I'm very proud of it. The university lecturer helped me write it. And um, I am working on another book at the moment as, as well, you know, which will be spiritual advice. Do you have a book that's already out? Yeah, I do. I have a book that's out on Amazon um, is one of the places you can get it from Booktopia and Amazon and Fishpond, all the normal kind of places. And it's called 
When All Else Fails by Carmel Bell. And it is basically, you know, runs through um, cases that I've dealt with and teaches people how to look after their energy system and talks about my near-death experiences and, you know, what happened and what I learned and that kind of thing. So, it's you know, it's a very good, basic, comprehensive book. Um, I certainly don't teach people medical intuition in that book. and It's not the kind of thing that should be taught in a book. I think it's, you know, much like medicine. It's hands-on kind of stuff, you know. At least nice to see each other anyway. Carmel. So if people would like to buy that book and leave me a review, I would be very happy. Carmel, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Your energy will never die. And when you go to heaven, you will still look and feel like yourself. And that is a good thing. Love goes on, and the most important thing in this world is to be kind. Carmel, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. This has been really lovely, actually. Very, yeah. I very much appreciated talking to you. You are a, a great interviewer, a great host. Well, thank you. And it's I'll give you five stars recommendation. Well, thank you, Carmel, and the pleasure has been all mine. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.